The lecture you are about to see is part of our annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate at UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought in an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back to back that matched a UW psychology professor with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Good evening. I'm Scott Murray, Associate Chair of Research for the Department of Psychology, and I have the distinct honor of welcoming you to the seventh annual, annual Edwards Public Lecture Series. I am pleased that you could join the psychology department as we celebrate one of our research specialties, understanding brains and behavior. Before introducing this evening's lecturers, I'd like to make a few comments about how, about how the series came about. This annual lecture series is the result of the generous support of Professor Alan L. Edwards, who made a substantial gift to establish an endowment that ensures that this series can take place free of charge to all of you in perpetuity. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the University of Washington's Department of Psychology for half a century from his arrival in 1944 as associate professor until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who is credited with changing the way modern psychological research is carried out by introducing modern statistical techniques to this field. His statistics books were long-standing gold standards for all of psychological research. The Edwards family contribution to the psychology department is an example of what can be accomplished with support from members of the community. The psychology department at the University of Washington is unique in that it emphasizes a biological and neuroscience emphasis throughout all of its core areas of research, including cognition and perception, social, developmental, clinical, and animal behavior. This year, our public lecture series highlights this neuroscience focus of our department as we try to better understand human and animal behavior. Tonight, we are fortunate to feature two of the world's leaders in neuroscience research related to hearing with a unique perspective of what the FISH auditory system can teach us. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening, Dr. Joseph Cisneros, who is an associate professor in the psychology department here at the University of Washington. Joe received his PhD in biology in 1999 from the Florida Institute of Technology followed by four years of postdoctoral work at Cornell University, including a summer as a grass fellow in neuroscience at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation since 2007. Joe has won numerous awards, including being recognized by Discover Magazine as having one of the, mo one of the 100 most important discoveries for the year 2004, titled Hearing tied to hormones in midshipman fish, a topic that we'll likely hear more about in this evening's lecture. Please help me welcome Dr. Joseph Cisneros. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. So before I begin tonight, I thought I'd first start off um, with a brief outline of my talk. And so I, what I'd like to do is start off with talking about origins of hearing in the vertebrate ear and then lead into a discussion of sound in the aquatic environment. And then kind of give you a description of the fish inner ear. Fish do have ears. And what is it exactly that fish hear with their ears in the aquatic environment? So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. And then also give you a description of why fish make good comparative models for the study of hearing. And then finally lead into um, some of the recent insights of adaptive hearing in the plain fin midshipman which is the fish that we study here in my lab at the University of Washington. So talking about the origins of hearing in the ear, I'd like to pose to you this question, when, where, and why did hearing evolve among vertebrates? So this may not be a question that you'll often ask yourself. In fact, many of you have probably never asked this question. But um, this happens to be a burning question to some comparative psychologists and sensory neurobiologists. As humans, 
we often think that hearing has reached its pinnacle in terms of evolution along with human speech. In fact, as humans, we often think that we're the foremost users of sound. The truth is, is that hearing is highly evolved in most vertebrates, and numerous species use sound for communication and to learn about their environment. The major selective pressure for the evolution of hearing was thought not to be for communication, but instead for survival, so that early vertebrates could extract and glean important information about their environment. Considering that the first vertebrates evolved in water, hearing is thought to have an aquatic origin, and which is depicted here in this slide by, by Ray Troll, which shows the transition of early vertebrate fish before making this migration onto a, a terrestrial or semi-terrestrial environment. To quote, quote a Ray Troll, fish were out of the ooze and then born to cruise. <laughs> so what is so special about sound and this aquatic environment? Well, it turns out underwater sound is ideal for the use, um, this underwater environment is ideal for the use of sound and sound propagation. Sound travels much faster in water than it does in air. In fact, it's five times faster in water than air, and it attenuates much more slowly in water than it does in air. Consequently, sound can travel considerable distances and is usually unobstructed by objects in this underwater environment. So I'm showing you here in this, in this slide an animation of a monopole sound source, a sound source emitting sound in all directions. If you think about sound propagation and the use of sound for communication in the open ocean, like a, very, like a free field envir environment out in deep water, many animals like humpback whales and blue whales use uh, very loud and low frequency <coughs> sound because it can travel very long distances unobstructed in this environment. It's thought that some of these whales can communicate hundreds of miles um, using low frequency sound. In 1967, uh, a sensory biologist and neuroethologist <coughs> by the name of William von Bergic, he speculated that perhaps the earliest uh, primitive uh, vertebrates, early fish, um, the earliest the auditory receptors were probably found on the skin of most fish, um, very similar to the surface lateral line system that we see today in modern fishes. So in this slide here, I'm showing you uh, a photo of a zebra fish and outlined on the, on the surface of this fish in green is phylloidin stained hair cells. This is part of the lateral line system. And then down below uh, is, a, is a diagram that shows these lateral line receptors on the surface of the body of these fish. So Van Bergic speculated that you know, perhaps the earliest auditory receptors were um, distributed in this fashion uh, in fish. But what about modern fish? What does the inner ear look like? So in this slide here, what I'm showing you is the brain and inner ear of a Hawaiian sergeant major fish. And to orient you here, let's see if I can get this pointer. I'd like to show you, here we go. Um, in this region, this is the forebrain of this fish. This is the telencephalon. And then here is the midbrain. And this is the tectum part of the midbrain. And this region here, this is the cerebellum. And then down, this is the hindbrain portion or, or medulla. Now, um, th this structure, so the, the inner ear of fish, of modern fish, is composed, of, it consists of three semicircular canals. So uh, where this arrow is, this is the anterior semicircular canal, posterior, and this is the, the horizontal canal. And then coupled with these semicircular canals, in this region here, this is the utricle. So these two components or portions of the inner ear, they make up the major vestibulary parts of the ear in, in fish. Now, I like to point out these two other structures. This, this structure and this one, this is the saccule and this is the lagina. These two components of the inner ear make up the major auditory parts of the fish's inner ear. And these two organs, they're, they're known as um, otolithic end organs and they contain these ear bones or otoliths. And I'm gonna talk more about um, the fish inner ear and how, and how it works and what, what fish hear um, in, in a moment. So what do fish hear? Well, they hear sound, of course, 
and sound can be simply defined as a mechanical disturbance that propagates as a longitudinal wave in both air and water. And it can be described in terms of both pressure, sound pressure, and particle motion. So pressure is defined as the fluctuation of the force per unit area above and below the ambient level. And particle motion is defined as the movement of fluid particles caused by these fluctuating um, forces of pressure. So in this cartoon here, what I'm showing you here is um, a sound. In this case, it's a pure tone. And as you get an increase in pressure, so you can see this, this pure tone is a sinusoidal waveform. And OK, here we go. And as you get an increase in pressure, corresponding to that, you get um, a compression of these fluid particles. Oh, thank you. And then when you get a decrease in pressure, when it goes below ambient, then you get this rarefication of these fluid particles. So you get this alternating compression and rarefication um, caused by um, sound pressure. Now what I'd like to show you is this propagating wave. Uh, and so this is an animation put together by my colleague David Zetties. And what it's showing you here, this is a, a sound projector or underwater speaker. And it's, it's this plain sound. You can see this alternation of compression, which is in blue, and then rarefication, which is in black. So let's see. As we play this, um, as you get this longitudinal sound wave being produced from this, this sound projector, you can see highlighted here in this, this square, you can see the movement of these fluid particles, right? So we get this compression and rarefication. Okay. All right. So in terms of, there's actually two modes or types of hearing in, in fishes. So here we have the first mode is known as this inertial mode. So all fish are thought to have this ability um, in terms of inertial mode. And what, what they're doing is they use their otolithic end organs to directly detect this particle motion. So just to show you, this is, the, again, the brain and the inner ear of, of the fish. And remember, I pointed out there are these two otolithic end organs that are the major parts, the auditory parts of the fish's inner ear. And so this is where these, um, these, the saccule and lagina is, and they're, they're mass loaded with these otoliths. And uh, what I want to play here is this, uh, again, this animation. And during sound stimulation, the fish moves with the same direction and um, phase and intensity as, as the, the surrounding medium, which is, which is the water. So you can see as the fish moves with this sound wave, because it's at the same density, inside the inner ear, we have these, the otoliths, right? And it turns out they are, they're much denser than the surrounding medium. They're about three times more dense than the fish's body and the surrounding water medium. And so during this stimulation, as that sound wave passes through the fish, that otolith will lag behind. It's also smaller in amplitude as, as that wave passes through the fish. And this otolith in the or end organ is coupled to the sensory head of bear, hair cells. So remember, in the saccule here, this is where the sensory bed of hair cells are located in the saccule and in the lagina. And at frequencies greater than 50 hertz, you get this shearing action, you get this oscillation. And when these hair cells, the stereocilia, when they bend towards this longer hair cell, the kinocilium, it causes these hair cells to become depolarized and it creates an action potential um, in, in, the, in the neuron that innervates these hair cells. And that information is then sent to the brain where it's later decoded. Okay, so that's, that's the inertial mode, directly detecting particle motion. There's a second mode um, in, in terms of fish hearing, and that's the pressure mode. So in this mode, the fish use their otolithic end organs to, to indirectly detect sound pressure. And they do this by detecting particle motion created by fluctuations of a gas-filled organ. So often fish will have a swim bladder, or they may have um, a gas bubble that's in close proximity to this inner ear. And as that sound pressure wave passes through the fish, it causes that bladder to resonate. 
And as it resonates, some fish, like the goldfish and zebrafish that I showed you earlier, they have these, these, ear, uh, these bones called Weberian ossicles that link or couple the swim bladder to the inner ear. So down in this, the bottom left here, um, I'm showing right here, this is the, the swim bladder. And you can see as it moves, as it resonates, it causes these Weberian ossicles to move and that can directly stimulate the inner ear. So this is more or less an indirect way of detecting sound pressure. Or in other cases, fish can have a, a gas bubble or even their bladder, which is close to, this, to the inner ear. And when it resonates, it causes particle motion, which then it can detect with these otolithic end organs. So these are the two major ways in which fish can detect these components of sound. So why study fish hearing? And you know, why are fish good models for the study of hearing? Well, I would like to propose to you that fish represent perhaps the simplest examples of how the vertebrate auditory system detects and identifies biologically relevant sounds that are critical for survival and reproduction. And they often do this in very complex acoustic environments. Also, fish have auditory pathways that are organized like those of more recently derived vertebrates like mammals. So this makes them very good compared to models. And also, fish may provide insight into the origin and evolution of the mechanism sound of sound detection and localization. And so this is something that our lab at Washington is very interested in studying these mechanisms that, that these fish use for detection and localization. So that brings us to our animal of interest, and that is the plain fin midshipman, Perthes notatus. Now these fish are found right here in our own backyard. They're very common in the Northwest. You find them as far north as Alaska and as far south as Magdalena Bay, Mexico. So shown here in this figure on the left, in yellow, this is the geographic distribution of this plain fin midshipman. So you can see up here in the northwest around Vancouver Island, Puget Sound, and the Seattle area, they're very common. And you find them as far south as Mexico. And in green, you start to have an overlap with the sister species. And this is the speckle fin midshipman. About Point Conception near Santa Barbara, that's where you start seeing the sister species. And, but you do get overlap with the plain fin. Now these fish are called the plain fin midshipmen. Midshipmen, they get their name primarily from the pattern of photophores that they have on their body. These fish are primarily deep, deep water. They spend three-fourths of the year out in, in deep water beyond 100 meters. And like other deep water fish, they're biluminescent. And so on the body, so down here below, these circular structures, these are the photophores on the body. And so when this fish was first described, it was thought that the pattern of these photophores looked lo a lot like the button pattern of a midshipman's uniform, hence the name. As I mentioned, you know, again, primarily found in deeper water anywhere from 50 to 300 meters most of the year, except during one time period, during the breeding season. So from late May to you know, late July, you can find these, these plain fin midshipmen all the way in the intertidal zone. So as I mentioned, late summer, early spring, um, these midshipmen, they migrate from these deep offshore sites all the way into this rocky intertidal zone. So here on the right, this is a typical nesting site that you can find these fish in the summer. This is the Hood Canal right here in western Washington. And what's interesting about these fish is there's actually three adult moors. So there's two types of males, and there's a female in this species. And I want to draw your attention to this this large male in the center, it's called a type one male. And type one males, these are the singing males or parental males. So these, these males sing like birds at night, they're nocturnal, and they produce this song to attract females for spawning. And so these males, they often will come in early during the breeding season, they se select prime nest sites under rocks, and they excavate a nest under these rocks, and then from these sites, at night, they produce their song to attract mates. This second type of male is known as a type two male or a sneaker male. It has a whole different type of reproductive strategy. So instead of investing energy into body size, you can see here, it's much smaller in size, but it's a fully mature male. And it invests more energy into testy growth. So 20% of its body weight is actually test, is, is testy. 
And so essentially, it's a swimming test. And its reproductive strategy is it will hang around these nest sites. And so when a female enters in to spawn with these type 1 males, they'll often will dart in and release their sperm to try to steal fertilizations from these type 1 males. OK. And it's, it's the type 1 male that does all the parental care. So once the female comes in, she spawns with the male. Um, at the next high tide, she will leave the nest and go back out to deeper water. It's the type 1 male or the singing male that will uh, care for all the young. So in this slide, you can see that this is um, the roof of a typical nest. And you can see I can make out three different broods of eggs that are, that are developing in the nest. So this here represents um, a batch of eggs from one female. Here's another, another group and a third. And so typically, a male will spawn with a female on a given night. And then once she leaves at the next high tide, the next, the next night, the male will call again to try to attract another female. And it takes about, so these eggs will develop for a, a few weeks, and then they'll hatch out. And you can see these embryos. And it takes roughly 30 to 40 days, based on water temperature, for them to fully develop. And as they develop, they become pigmented. And after they fully absorb their yolk, then they detach from the rock, and they move out into deeper water, and often into the seagrass beds, where there's safety and, and food resources. OK. So these midshipmen, they're highly vocal fish. They generate acoustic signals for intraspecific communication during social and reproductive behaviors. So how do they do this? Well, they have uh, a swim bladder, which they use for, for buoyancy. But attached to the swim bladder, they have these red, in this cartoon here, you can see in yellow, this is the swim bladder. In red, this is the sonic muscle. And attached to this bladder, they can contract these sonic muscles to produce sound. And they can do this um, during the breeding season. So typically, the type 1 males, these muscles be will become enlarged during the breeding season to produce these sounds. And so I want to kind of play for you some. There's three known vocalizations. The first vocalization that I like to play for you is known as a grunt. So this is a, an agonistic call. Typically, it's more or less a warning call. So if you disturb these fish while they're in the nest, they'll produce this sound. OK. And so they can produce this as single grunts or trains of grunts. And all morphs can produce this signal. So females, type 2s, and type 1 males can produce these grunts. A second type of, of vocal signal they produce is known as a growl. And these growls are only produced by these nesting type 1 males. And typically, early in the breeding season, when they're battling out for these prime nest sites, you'll often hear type 1 males, as depicted here in this cartoon. They'll often produce growls um, during the defense or guarding of their nests. And the growls sound like this. And then finally, there's the third, the third type of call. And this is known as a hum or the mate call or advertisement call. And in, in California, they're very notorious for this type of signal they produce. In fact, they've often been called the California singing fish. And this is based on the mate call that they produce or this advertisement call. So I want to play this for you. Keep in mind, if you were a female midshipman, you would find this irresistible. OK? <laughs> Here we go. This is, this is the mate call. This is the hum. And they can produce this, this vocalization for sometimes you know, on the order of minutes or sometimes an hour or two hours in duration. On the surface, this may not seem like a, a very special feat. But if you think about how they're producing this sound, they're contracting these sonic muscles around the swim bladder to produce this call. So what I'm showing you here on the right this is a power spectrum. This kind of gives you an idea of the energy associated with frequency in the call I just played for you. And so what I want to draw to your attention is this first peak. This first peak shows that there's a lot of energy around 100 hertz. Turns out this is the contraction rate that that male is, is contracting those sonic muscles to produce that hum. And, and they can do this. You know, If you can imagine contracting these muscles 
at 100 times a second for an hour. So midshipmen have been called the vocal champions of vertebrates. And they can do this for sustained periods of time. But this is going to become important later in my talk. But also in the call, there's a lot of energy in these harmonics. So if you look at, at 200 hertz, 300 hertz, and 400 hertz, there's a lot of energy in these harmonics, just as much or more than this fundamental. And this is going to be important later in terms of how, fish, how they may use this for detection, localization, and perhaps assessing mates. So, and what's nice about the midshipmen is that you can bring them into a semi a natural environment like, like a marine lab at Friday Harbor, or often we'll go to UC Davis's marine lab in Bodega Bay. And what you can do is you can bring these males in and set them up in a tank. And if you give them a shelter, they'll, they'll take the shelter up and they'll start calling, producing their mate calls. So you can look at some of these behaviors in sem semi-natural environments. So I'm going to show you this video. This video is actually courtesy of Andrew Bass. He's a um, Cornell professor who's, who um, really put this fish on the map in terms of its behavior and the neurobiology bi behind acoustic communication in the species. So in this video, you can see the male, right? He's at the entrance of the nest. And he's producing this hum. You can hear it in the background. And he's working hard. You can see he's ventilating very heavily, producing it's very energet energetically expensive. And then a female is introduced in the back of the tank. And this female is in reproductive condition. She's ready to spawn. And um, I like showing this video. Look, look how gently he coaxes her into the nest. <laughs> gently brings her into the nest. And then you know, she's free to leave. And the male, the male stops humming. She circles back in. And then typically, um, the sequence of behaviors that happens after this, they would begin to, to um, go, undergo courtship, and the female would begin to lay her eggs on the roof of the nest, and the male would fertilize them. So she lays um, each egg individually, and then the male will fertilize them. So she'll spend the, the rest of the night really, you know, um, spawning with that male, uh, releasing each egg um, one at a time. So the main point about this species is that sound is obviously very important, and their whole life history revolves around producing and detecting sound. So I have one other video. that This is the video that really hooked me on this species. We know that females, reproductive females, will show robust funnel taxes to the hum. So if you simulate this may call, in fact, remember, this is this power spectrum of the hum. If you play back a pure tone um, at this, at this um, fundamental frequency at about 100 hertz, it's sufficient enough to cause a female to um, move towards the sound source. So this is this phototaxis response. And again, this was a video from, from Andrew Bass's lab. This was from a PhD student um, who early on in, in the 90s was interested in studying this type of phototaxis behavior. And in this video, what, what you see here, this is, again, since these animals are nocturnal, these, these experiments are done at night in these open tanks at this marine lab, at UC Davis's marine lab. And in the center of the tank, you see this underwater speaker. It's in this kind of PVC pipe frame. And then in this region, you're going to see a female kind of enter, enter your view, and you'll see how she reacts to this simulated hum. OK. You can see she's right on the speaker, on the face of that speaker, looking for that male. Where is that singing male? Where is that type 1 male? You know, very interested in the sound source. And then you'll hear the, the hum will, will terminate. And now you just hear background noise of water um, actually going down the drain of this tank. And then you'll hear a series of, of growls. There's the growl. Remember, this is an agonistic call. So this is, this is not something that a male would do to entice a female. And she's resting here on the bottom of the tank right here. And then you hear a series of grunts. Okay, and she's again resting on the bottom of the tank. If you play this long enough, she'll actually move away from that sound source. Again, this is an agonistic call. This is a warning call. And then finally, the hum will come back on. And watch the reaction. And she 
just brought it on the sound source. So you can do this all night. Turn it on, turn it off, and should respond in this way. It's pretty amazing. Okay. But what I haven't told you is that only gravid females, only females that are full of eggs, ready to spawn, uh, exhibit this response. So once they've laid their eggs, they're no longer interested in that sound source. So based on these behavioral experiments, we got really interested in, you know, could there be something about reproductive state, being gravid versus non-gravid, and might this influence the hearing properties of this fish? So to test this, we wanted to test a specific hypothesis, and this hypothesis was, can seasonal variation in reproductive state of the female modulate change the response properties of this peripheral auditory system. So we're talking, you know, sensitivity or response properties at the level of the saccule or the auditory nerve that innervates that, that end organ, end organ saccule. So to test this, we wanted to examine the hearing properties of non-reproductive winter fish females versus summer reproductive females. So to collect the winter females, as I mentioned, they spend most of the time out in deeper water. So we would have to go out and use a, a, a trawl. We could charter a boat, go off California or off here at Puget Sound, and we can use an otter trawl to collect these animals in, in their deeper depths. And then we, one thing we noticed is that these females, they're in non-reproductive condition. So often their, their ovaries um, contain undeveloped oocytes. And that's, um, these eggs or oocytes are often very small, less than one millimeter in diameter, so it's pretty obvious that they're regressed, they're not in reproductive condition. To get the, the reproductive summer females, we can collect these right out of the intertidal zone in the summer. So again, this is a, a, another nesting site. This is typ a typical nesting site here in Washington, western Washington. We can go out at low tide, and often these nests are completely exposed. And these animals, are, they're very robust, they're very hardy. Often, males, if you look at this nest, this nest is completely dry. These males can actually withstand being out of the water for sometimes an hour or two hours in duration. And so you can go collect females right out of the nest. And if, here's a diagram of, of a reproductive female. And you can see, in this diagram, you can see this is the ovary. They're often full of ripe um, eggs. They're about five millimeters in diameter. And they often have a nice kind of yellow, orange coloration to them. And in this diagram, you can see this is the swim bladder and the sonic muscle around the swim bladder. So her body cavity, she's just full of eggs um, during this condition. So we, can, we have these females in different reproductive states, and we can actually examine the auditory physiology. So we can look at differences in hearing sensitivity. So in these experiments, uh, and this is a, a diagram of the brain. This is the forebrain of the midshipman, midbrain, this is cerebellum, this is hindbrain, and this is the saccule. So this is the, the main organ of hearing that I showed you in fish. This is the saccule. And you can see the, the outline of the otolith in this, in this saccule. And we can record from auditory neurons, single unit neurons, in this, this acoustic nerve that innervates hair cells in this end organ, in the saccule. Or we can also place electrodes down into the saccule itself and record from populations of hair cells. So this is the peripheral auditory system that I was, I was mentioning earlier. And so we can play back in terms of our auditory stimuli, we can play back single tones, pure tones, um, that range from 65 up to 400 hertz. And we can play back um, these sounds at levels from 90 to about 151 dB relative to one micropascal. I mean, this probably doesn't mean much to you, but I can say that this is the sound level that you could, you could record from inside or directly outside the nest. So it's definitely, definitely within the biological range of hearing in these fish. So how do we quantify, at least at the level of the, the eighth nerve, the acoustic nerve, um, of sound encoding? So neural activity is measured by means of either recording spike rate, looking at average evoked spike rate during the duration of the stimulus, or we can look at this other metric known as vector strength to synchronization. 
So this is a measure to look at phase locking of those auditory neurons to the sound stimulus. So in this cartoon, I'd like to walk you through this. This is a typical uh, sound stimulus. This is a pure tone. And typically, this is in this below, this shows the response of these individual auditory neurons that you can record from. And typically, they become what's known as phase locked to the stimulus. So um, you can see here this, you get an action potential, a spike from that neuron. And it, in this case, it occurs during the same phase at the trough of this of every cycle. And we can measure, we can quantify um, this synchronization. And to show you that in a little bit more detail, here is um, a scenario where you have strong phase locking. So again, you can see this action potential from this neuron fires at the exact same phase. And when this happens, when you get perfect synchronization, this is, this is uh, equivalent to a vector strength of one. And the idea here is if this neuron fires during the exact same phase, what it's doing, it's encoding period, the periodicity of the signal. And the inverse of period is frequency. So this information's coded by this auditory neuron, and then it's sent to the brain where it's later decoded. Frequency information can be extracted out. So this is perfect synchronization. This is a vector strength of one. Then in cases where you have a very weak phase locking, right? Uh, in this example, there is no relationship. You get random firing of these auditory neurons in relation to the stimulus. And as you quantify this, you get a very low vector strength value. Okay? So this is going to be important in the next slide. So this is how this information is coded. Now looking at data from these females, right? if we compare females in this reproductive state versus non-reproductive state, we see that there's seasonal differences in frequency sensitivity. So remember, this is that metric I was telling you earlier, vector strength. So if you have perfect synchronization, this is a good measure of frequency encoding. That would be one. Random firing would be zero. So if you look at, this is our data set from 24 females that were collected from the winter. We recorded from 88 neurons. And this shows um, uh, all our data. And what you see is, in general, these females are more responsive. They have better phase locking ability at the lower frequencies. So if you look at 0.7, this is kind of a robust measure for phase locking. You can see that pretty high phase locking at frequencies about 140 or less. But now, if you compare this to the summer state, so when we collect these females right out of the nest, what you see right away is that the phase locking is much greater at these higher frequencies. Okay, so actually it doesn't drop down to 0.7 until well beyond 300 hertz. And so what might be important for this? Well, remember earlier I showed you that power spectrum of the hum. There's a lot of information in the harmonics at 2 and 300 hertz, which is, corresponds right in this area. Okay, so this is at the level of the auditory neuron. But more recently, we also looked at uh, seasonal differences in frequency sensitivity of the level of the hair cells. So we can actually go in and record from populations of hair cells in the saccule. And in this, in this diagram here, or this plot, what I'm showing you is these are threshold measures. This is sen these are sensitivity measures of these hair cells at various frequencies. So once we record from these saccular hair cells, we can systematically lower the sound level until we no longer get a, a recordable response. And the bottom line here is in yellow, these are summer females. They have lower thresholds at all these frequencies, and they're much se more sensitive um, in this reproductive state than they are when you collect them in the winter. So in green, they have, these are um, the thresholds for the, the non-gravid winter females, and the thresholds are much higher. So females are much more sensitive um, during the reproductive summer than they are in the winter. So you might ask, you know, so what is the functional significance of this seasonal auditory plasticity? And what we're proposing is that this seasonal plasticity may function to increase the probability of mate detection and localization during the summer breeding season. So remember, this is the environment that we find these males, these type 1 males. They're singing in the intertidal zone trying to attract a mate. The female is the primary receiver. And if you overlay the data from the auditory neurons, remember in yellow, this is the sensitivity of females in the winter. 
And in green is the sensitivity from these auditory neurons from females in the summer when they're gravid. And what we can see here is that females in the summer are better suited to encode more information in that male's song, right? So at the second and third harmonic, they can encode the, the information in these harmonics and even this fourth harmonic much better than they're able to say in, in, in the winter. And we think that, that these harmonics likely increase hum detection. So in this environment, if you look at propagation of sound, it turns out higher frequencies propagate much better than lower frequencies. So, and this is related to water depth and the substrate um, composition in this environment. So we think it's, it's the harmonics that propagate further from the nest. And females are now, in this condition, are better suited to encode this information that might enhance their ability for detection and localization of singing males. So what might be the mechanism for this kind of seasonal plasticity? So the hypothesis that we um, set out to test was that perhaps this seasonal expression of perhaps gonadal steroids might change or modulate the frequency sensitivity of these auditory neurons. And so to do this, we needed to know something about the reproductive cycle. And so we went out and collected females during, all t during different parts of the reproductive cycle. And here I'm showing you, this is a measure of their, of their ovary size. So this, this would be the non-reproductive winter period versus the pre-nesting spring, nesting period, and post-nesting period. And so in the winter, their ovaries are much smaller in size. They start to develop seasonally during the spring, and then they reach maximum size during the summer when you find them in the nest. So if you sample these females during these four different time periods, and you look for circulating, and you examine for circulating levels of gonadal steroids, what we find is that the hormone levels are low pretty much all times of the year except during one time point. About a month before you find them insured in the spring, they get a spike of testosterone and they get a spike of estradiol. And so we asked the question, if you simulate this spike, can you induce this change in hearing sensitivity that we showed earlier? So remember, this is kind of the tuning profile, response profile, winter females. Here's the summer. If you implant these females in the winter, with empty capsules, no hormones, and you wait, um, in, this, in this case we did uh, controls, these are our controls, versus treated estrogen and testosterone, we were able to show differences. So this is, the win this is the control state, which is much like the winter condition, which we would expect. But with the testosterone implants, after 23 days, we started to see this change. So we can induce this change. The females appear to have this Again, the summer phenotype. So we had higher vector strength, better phase locking um, at these higher frequencies, much like the summer condition. And we know that testosterone can be converted into estradiol by an enzyme called aromatase. So we weren't sure, was it due to testosterone or perhaps estradiol? So we also tested estradiol directly, and sure enough, after a minimum of 23 days, we're able to induce this change in hearing sensitivity. The, the tuning profile was a lot like these summer gravid females when you collect them out of the nest. And so along with this, we were able to clone the estrogen receptor. So we were able to look, where is estrogen receptor being expressed in, in the brain and what about the ear, the sacula, which is the main organ of hearing in this fish, and it turns out that when we implanted these females, we could upregulate, we could show expression of estrogen receptor right there in the saccule. So this shows um, uh, estrogen being expressed in the saccular epithelium along in the ovary and the liver, which was another control. And so there's been further support for the effects of estrogen on high frequency hearing in, in humans and in rodents. So we've known for a long time the estrogen receptor is found in the human cochlea, but there hasn't really been a link between the functional significance of estrogen in the inner ear. But we do know from, from studies on humans, individuals with Turner syndrome, they, they, um, women with this, affected with this condition, they exhibit a progressive high frequency hearing loss at the level of the eighth nerve and cochlea. So as these women, when they reach adulthood, they have um, 
a decrease in estrogen production and coupled with that high frequency hearing loss. And so this shows in, in mice that also have this condition, Turner mice, you can look at during development, um, these are hearing thresholds. This is another measure for looking at hearing sensitivity in, in, these, in these mice. And what we find is that this is a normal condition through, as they age, their, their um, tuning thresholds do not change much, but mice with Turner syndrome, they have um, a progressive high frequency hearing loss. So we think with the midshipmen, we might have a good model to look at this link between estrogen and high frequency hearing. In our system, there's an adaptive coupling of the sender of the male, which produces the song, and the receiver, which is the female. So in green, remember this is the summer phenotype of females, and in yellow is the winter. And again, when you implant these females with either testosterone or estradiol, you can induce this summer phenotype, right? So we think, again, they're better adapted to hear more information in, in the male's call during this time when they're in the shallow water environment. So there are remaining questions. You know, where is the site of action for these gonadal steroids? Remember, we've, we've looked at the level of the saccule and the auditory nerve, and why does it take a minimum of 23 days for this effect to occur? So more recently, our lab has shifted to look at, you know, what about seasonal changes in hair cell density and hair cell morphology? So this is a, a micrograph showing where we can actually visualize, we can stain um, these hair cells in the saccule, and in green, this is a phylloidin stain, which stains actin in the hair cells, and we can, we can use this, we can do this with, um, with the confocal microscopy, or even at the level using a scanning EM to examine this in more detail. And so, you know, we ask the question, are there seasonal changes in hair cell sensitivity that's concurrent with changes at the level of the, of the hair cell in terms of morphology and density? And, and recently, we published some work that show, in fact, there are seasonal differences in, in, in hair cell density. So remember, this, so this is the saccule of the midshipman, and you can look at the saccular epithelium. This is a sensory bed of hair cells, and we've looked at seven different regions of the ear of these female fish in both non-reproductive and reproductive fish. And we're able to show in that in these regions, we get greater density of hair cells in the summer in these gravid females than in, than in the winter. And these are concurrent with changes in sensitivity. And this is only relegated to the saccule. So if you look at the other end organs, the lagina and the utricle, there is no seasonal difference in hair cell density. And so another thing we, we noticed um, early on is that there's actually differences in terms of um, the number of small hair bundles. So we're currently interested, do these represent immature hair cells that are coming online, or perhaps they represent a different adult hair cell type? So we found that, in fact, in different regions of the ear, these seven regions, and in fact, there are more smaller hair cells um, in the summer than there are in the winter. And then finally, we looked at hair cell proliferation and hair cell death. So the bottom line is that there is no difference. So if we looked at Lagina, utricle, and saccule, there's equal amounts of hair cell proliferation in the summer and in the winter, but there's a difference in, in hair cell death. So fish continuously grow hair cells throughout their lifetime, and they're always turning over. You're getting hair cell um, proliferation and hair cell death, but it turns out in the summer, there's greater, um, or, I'm sorry, in the, in the winter, there's greater hair cell death. So we think the net result of this proliferation and death is that you get a greater density of hair cells in these summer reproductive females. Okay, so then just to summarize, that females exhibit an increase in hair cell density um, in the summer, and this, and this change in density is concurrent with changes in hair cell sensitivity of hair cells in the saccule. Re reproductive females show an increase in the number of small, potential, immature saccular hair cell bundles and that this correlated change in hair cell addition and sensitivity may in part facilitate this auditory adaptive plasticity to enhance mate detection and localization during the breeding season. So currently, we're pursuing this question, what role do hormones play 
the net increase in hair cell density and sensitivity? Well, stay tuned for the answer to that, no pun intended. So I'd like to thank members of my lab that um, they're responsible for a, a lot of this work, especially the hair cell, hair cell study. Um, Ali Coffin, who was a collaborator here at the University of Washington, who's now faculty at Washington State in Vancouver. Rob Moore, a grad student in my lab. Liz Whitchurch, who's a postdoc. And we had um, various help, Paul Folano, Ashwin Bondiwad, who's a grad student in my lab. A lot of the field work. And a lot of these pictures that you saw that I presented were from Midge Marcheter, Margaret Marcheter from Cornell, and Peter Alberts, uh, my graduate student. And again, I'd like to thank Andrew Bass from Cornell. And the support for research, the funding was um, National Science Foundation and the University of Washington Royal Research Fund. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, I just want to remind people if they could use the microphones on the stairs. Um, I have a question for you, Joe, actually. Sure. I can't help but ask about the type 2 males, the swimming um, testes, as you call them. <laughs> so they would seem to have potentially a reproductive strategy that's somewhat like the females in the sense that they have to find males, right? Um, just as the females have to find males. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if, if they also have a, potentially a seasonality to their hearing as well. So this is something Liz Wischurch, my lab, a postdoc, she's, she's um, examined this question. And so what we found, the preliminary results suggest that, that these type 2 males in the summer, they're just as sensitive or perhaps even more sensitive than females. So you can imagine that it may be important if these type 2 males, they also may be selecting nest sites similar to similar strategies as females. So you know, typically we find these nest sites are not evenly distributed uh, on the shoreline. They tend to be clumped. So we're interested, what are these behavioral strategies? Why do these males form these clusters of nests? And you know, is there one dominant male? You, you can imagine that there may be strategies for, say, less dominant males. If they, if they set up their, net, their shop or nest near a dominant male, they might have a higher probability of encountering fem reproductive females. And so these type 2 males may also, you know, if, if they are also paying attention and they have changes in sensitivity, they also may, may gravitate or locate their, their, their activity near these uh, larger males, right? So there may be, we, we think there, there's issues that, it, so we want to know, do hormones also influence sensitivity in, in perhaps type 2s? Uh, how many years do these fish live? And is, is there a fish equivalent, say, to the menopause in, <laughs> and, in both males and females? You know, that's a great question. So, you know, most deep water fish, like rockfishes, some of these fish can live 80 to 100 years. Um, but this, this fish, midshipmen, there's only been one study, it's an unpublished study, to look at, you know, how long do these midshipmen live? And I, I think the best estimates are actually rather short, perhaps 8 to 10 years. And it may have something to do with, you know, they're undergoing these seasonal vertical migrations, and they're, they're migrating into this very kind of stressful, harsh environment. When they come in into the intertidal zone, they undergo periods of you know, low oxygen, hypoxic conditions, changes in temperature, changes in salinity. So this may be more stress on these animals. So as far as we know, you, you can take those otoliths and you can use these. Often fisheries biologists, they will sand these down and you can count the rings, like trees lay down rings, and you can count um, the age of these fish. You can estimate the age. And so it's thought they don't actually live as long as, say, other rockfish, you know. And so, you know, there may be a trade-off. You know, they, they may come into the intertidal zone. Perhaps they do this because it's warmer temperature. Maybe it speeds up the development of the young. But also, you know, it's, it's this trade-off. Maybe they don't live as long. So, good question. Yes. Yeah, if these fish live 100 meters below the surface, where it's always, I assume, the same darkness and the same temperature, do you know what cues them to know the seasons and when they should, uh, you know, go into the into the reproductive right. cycle or not? So these fish, you know, it's you know, we think that it might be either temperature or photo period. So even though they're down at say 100 meters, there may be still some light cues available to them. So typically in the spring, right about now. 
These fish slowly migrate. They have to adjust the buoyancy of their bladder to adjust their depth. So typically in the spring, you start to find them at 80 or 60 meters. So they slowly rise um, in, in the springtime, and then they finally make it into the, the shallows in the summer. But we think it might be a combination of probably photo period and maybe temperature. Um, at, so they're nocturnal. They come up into the water column at night. They often will drift with the currents, and they feed on zooplankton and, um, and small fish during that time. <laughs>